A few years ago, when I was 13 years old, I attended a summer camp that I loved very much. I would go there every summer to make new friends, and see old ones too. But after my last experience at summer camp, I would never be going again. It was a Tuesday, I believe, and we had just gotten done eating our lunch. After lunch, the group had a choice of either going swimming or fishing. The camp did have a small lake where you could go fishing, and I myself had never tried it. I figured I might as well give it a shot. It was just me and a few other kids. As the instructor was teaching us how to put the hook on the line, I saw a man emerge from the tree line on the other side of the lake. I thought nothing of it, and continued to focus on trying to get a good catch. I thought I caught the man's eyes looking in my direction though, and eventually I looked up at him. He was indeed just staring right at me. Let me give you a description of this man. He had a blue jacket, sweatpants, and was wearing sandals, along with a big hat. I didn't know who this person was. I went over to the instructor to tell him about this mysterious man, but of course, as soon as I told him about the guy, the man was already gone. I continued fishing for about another hour, before it was time for the group to go back inside the gym for sports. At one point, I had to use the restroom though, so I started making my way over to the women's restroom. I stepped inside, and I heard a man's voice call out to me, Hello again. Before I could even say something, the same man from earlier stepped out from one of the stalls and looked right at me. I saw craziness in his red eyes and was disgusted by the smell of marijuana on him. He then whispered to me, Come with me. I want you to see something cool. I walked over to the door to exit the restroom. He tried to block me from leaving and grabbed me hard by the arm. He then said to me in a furious tone, If you scream, I will kill you. Do you understand? I nodded my head telling him that I understood. My dad had always told me to keep calm and try to think of what to do if I ever came across a situation like this. That's exactly what I did. I kept calm and did everything the man asked. As he was walking out with me while holding my arm, I heard a deep voice yell from behind us. Thank God it was a police officer. I immediately began screaming and kicking, trying to fight for my life. After a few seconds, the man let go and ran to his car. The police officer chased after him. Another officer escorted me to the gym, where the rest of the group was. He explained what happened to the counselor and staff. My mom picked me up early that day, and I never went back to summer camp again. My advice is to please be careful, because there are dangerous people out there all around, and you never know what they might do if they catch you. A few years ago, I was on a camping trip with the scouts for a week. I've always been a camping slash outdoors person. That's really the main reason why I joined the scouts in the first place. We were going to a camp in North Carolina. We lived in Florida, so we would be taking a long bus trip there. We left on Friday and got there Saturday evening. Once we got there, our scoutmaster told us to unpack everything and get our tent set up as quickly as we could. We only had a good hour or so of daylight left anyway. Within about 45 minutes, we had been set up and started cooking our meals. My friend, we'll call him Eric, who was also in the scouts and who I'm still friends with to this day, told us we should go and explore the woods a bit. Now, I wasn't exactly sure if the scouts were allowed to go exploring into the woods, but our scoutmaster had said earlier that we could go anywhere, as long as we were with another scout. Therefore, we figured it would be okay. Anyway, we started making our way into the woods with our flashlights. It was getting quite dark now. We walked about ten minutes or so, when we stumbled across this small little shed 
that looked like it had been abandoned for the past 60 years at least. At this point, we weren't sure what to make of it. Eric said that we should go inside and look around. Me, on the other hand, knew we were going to get into serious trouble if we trespassed inside. I said no, but Eric went on and called me a wuss and said that I was always afraid of everything. It honestly bothered me at the time, so I sighed and said we could go in for a few minutes. The door was basically broken down, so we didn't have any problems getting inside. We got inside and turned on our flashlights. It was basically empty. There was some furniture, but that was pretty much it. Eric then said, what is that? He was shining his light on a rope hanging down from the roof. It took me a few seconds before I realized it was a noose. I told him to just leave it alone. As we were walking out, Eric tripped over something soft. We shined our light down to see what he had tripped on and ran out of there as fast as we could back down the trail. We stopped to catch our breath after a while and began panicking. What we'd seen was the dead body of a random woman. She looked like she'd been dead for about a week at most. We were talking about whether or not we should report it. We decided not to tell anyone, since for some reason we were afraid we would get into trouble. After that, we barely talked to anyone for the rest of the trip. The day we were packing up and leaving, Eric and I decided to go see if anything had changed at the shed. And surprisingly, something had. All the furniture was gone, along with the body and the noose. Someone had known we had been there. We left and reported it to our scoutmaster once we got back. We explained everything, and thank God he believed us. Within 20 minutes, they had police searching the shed, but I don't know if anything happened after. Needless to say, we still got in trouble anyway, but I was expecting that. About a week later, I was watching the news when I happened to see that the police had found a man. He had been hiding in the shed when we'd found it. He admitted that he had hung and killed the woman inside, who turned out to be his girlfriend. He was put in jail for life without parole. But yeah, I don't think I'll be joining a scouch trip for a long while yet. This happened when I was 15 years old. Every summer, my family and I would go up to New York to visit relatives. It was very fun overall, and my aunt and uncle would take me everywhere. Anyway, there would be some days I would sleep at my grandma's house, and there would be other days I would sleep at my aunt and uncle's house. This night, however, I was staying at my uncle's house, as my grandma was out of town for a few days. My aunt and uncle had just recently had a baby and she had her own room. That meant I had to sleep downstairs in the living room. They didn't have an air mattress, so I had to sleep on the couch, which was extremely uncomfortable. The living room has a lot of windows. Three behind the couch and a huge window out front where you could see out into the woods. I was tossing and turning, trying to get to a good position where I could feel comfortable. I'd been there about 10 minutes, rolling around and trying to get some sleep. I finally started to drift off, but I was awoken to what sounded like a strange banging noise. I dismissed the noise as just a dream at first, but then the noise continued. This time I fully woke up and began searching around the room for the cause of this noise. I then found it, standing at the big glass window was a man knocking on it. He was wearing a black hoodie, and in his free hand was a big knife. Surprisingly to me, it didn't seem like the man had even noticed me. He wasn't looking in my direction. It was more like he was looking around the room to see if anyone was there. I knew it was only a matter of moments before he would spot me, and God only knows what he was planning on doing. I gathered up the courage to sprint upstairs to my uncle's room. I immediately told him everything that was going on. He grabbed his hunting rifle and rushed downstairs to show the man he was armed. The man was still waiting there, but instead of running away, he just started laughing maniacally. 
It wasn't a normal laugh. It was a low, threatening one, as if he wasn't afraid of my uncle at all. Not even five seconds later, we heard a window from the other side of the house smash open. We then realized there was more than one person. We bolted up the stairs, awaking both my aunt and the baby. We heard a pair of footsteps coming up the stairs fast behind us. We took that chance to climb out our window and drop down to the ground. We didn't care what was in front of us, only what was behind. We booked it to the neighbor's house and called the police. They investigated and told us the house had been broken into and many valuables had been stolen. I remember it being a kind of cold night in October. The day had been quite long, and I was exhausted from a work trip that had me driving for hours. Now, for context, I'm a somewhat smaller man, and always considered myself a sort of pessimist. I decided to pull over into what looked to be a run-of-the-mill hotel that was just off the freeway. It was one of those places people on road trips could stay at, without having to drive into a big city. The hotel looked like it had seen better days, obviously. The sign outside read vacant, and I didn't have to wonder why. The parking lot was practically empty, save for a few rusted-up old beaters. I parked my own car and made my way to the lobby inside. I was greeted by a sort of disinterested clerk who was too busy paying attention to his phone to even look up at me. I paid for a room and was handed a key, barely receiving a single word during the whole interaction. It was kind of weird, honestly. As I made my way to my room, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was really off about this place, but I was too exhausted to care. My room was no better than the rest of the place. The curtains were torn and stained in multiple places, and the air smelled like mildew. I decided to take a quick shower and practically collapsed onto the bed. My plan was to catch a few hours of sleep, then wake up and get out of there before sunrise. I must have slept for no more than an hour when I was jolted awake by a loud argument coming from the room next door. It sounded like a couple of people were arguing over something I couldn't quite make out. I got out of bed and pressed my ear against the really thin wall that separated our two rooms. I could make it out sort of muffled like, Where's the money, Dirk? There was a very gruff voice demanding this. I remember specifically someone saying back, I swear, Joey, I'll get it to you by tomorrow. The other guy, who I'm guessing was probably that Dirk person, sounded incredibly scared. It was kind of surreal, honestly. I could hear moment by moment the conversation escalating, and it became quite clear to me that someone was going to get hurt here. I knew I had to do something, but fear pretty much had me frozen there. I contemplated calling the police, but I didn't have any concrete information to really provide them. Not to get political either, but I also know that police can just make situations worse. Just as I was considering my options, the argument appeared to turn violent. I heard a loud crash echoing through the walls, followed by what I could only assume were blows being landed. Again, the walls were almost paper thin. I could hear everything. I'm completely sure I heard someone being attacked, but I didn't know what to assume considering they were both just yelling at each other. But based on the sounds from before, it didn't appear that Dirk had an upper hand. I exited the room and sort of tiptoed to the door, peeking through the peephole in the neighboring room. The hotel was old, and obviously hadn't bothered changing to one-way peepholes. What I saw at that moment gave me chills. Dirk, I assume, was being held down by two men, both much larger and a lot scarier than he was. He was badly bruised, and there was blood dripping down from his nose and out of his mouth. His eyes were completely swollen shut, and tears were rolling down his face. I could even hear him now begging for his life. 
The men had their backs to the door, and I knew I had no choice at that moment but to contact somebody. It would have been wrong for me to not set my own personal opinions aside when someone's life could be in danger. I immediately grabbed my cell phone and called 911. I whispered to the dispatcher about the situation and explained my location as best I could. It was a bit hard though considering I didn't really know the area I was going through all that well. My heart was pounding in my chest as I crept back to that peephole, trying to keep my tabs on the nightmare that was happening right next door. Just as I looked through this time, I saw one of the men draw a gun from his waistband. Panic surged through me and I sank to the floor. I was scared. I couldn't risk them seeing or hearing me through the door. The sound of gunshots pierced through the air, and I could hear screams of agony. Tears started to well up in my eyes. I felt completely helpless. The minutes dragged on as I huddled on the floor just inside my room. The sound of suffering next door was one of the worst things I'd ever heard. The man was moaning and crying out in pain. I listened to the other two make fun of him. They said they found him weak for showing that he was in that type of pain. I found it incredibly disgusting, considering they just shot him multiple times. I heard more shuffling in the room next door, and was relieved to hear what sounded like the men leaving after what felt like a small eternity. I actually heard sirens approaching the hotel too. Relief washed over me as I looked through my own peephole and saw the police arrive, followed soon after by paramedics. The officers inside pounded on the room next door to me, demanding that whoever was inside surrender right now. I guess they hadn't realized the men had already left. The only response they got was Dirk pleading for them to help him. I heard them break down the door and call the paramedics over. I was full of fear and anxiety as I waited for the officers to clear the scene and hopefully get this guy to safety. An officer knocked on my door, identifying himself. I opened the door and was eager to tell him everything that happened. They told me they'd have to take me down to the station to make a formal statement. I found that odd, but I did what I had to do. I packed up my stuff from my room and headed down to the police station. As I sat there that night, providing my statement to a detective for what seemed like the hundredth time, I couldn't help but think about whether or not that guy was okay. I never met him or even interacted with him once, but somehow I felt a connection with him. In my eyes, no one deserves to die in such a violent way, just because they probably owed someone money. I wish there was more I could have done, honestly. But with how small I am and not really being trained in anything, if I would have tried to personally intervene, I probably would have been injured or killed too. No matter how many people like to say they would, I just couldn't risk my own life for someone I didn't even know. I was informed later that night the guy had passed away not long after arriving at the hospital. His gunshot wounds were pretty severe. It was nothing they could do. The detective assured me I'd done the right thing by calling the police, and that my testimony would be important in bringing the men responsible to justice, if and when they were found. Unfortunately, as I'm writing this, it's been almost nine years, and there's been no news on this case. I'm sad that his family hasn't received justice for his murder. The events of that night have left me completely traumatized, but I have to remember how lucky I am to still have my own life. That's something that guy will never have. And the only thing separating the two of us that night was a single wall. Different life decisions led us to the same place at the same time but somehow still worlds away from one another. So, just to give you a picture, I'm not a small woman at all. I'm over six feet tall, and I weigh about 200 pounds. That paired with the fact that a lot of that weight is in fact muscle doesn't make me the most obvious target. Even though that's what I've always told myself, it didn't make it true though. I guess in the eyes of an evil man, a woman is a woman all the same. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I had something he wanted. 
I think we all know what I'm talking about without me having to say it. I usually work from home, but every so often I have to take a refresher course with my company so they can make sure I still know what I'm doing and track my progress. Honestly, I think it's a little bit unnecessary for someone who's been doing the job for 10 years like I have, but I understand it's part of making sure the company runs smoothly. If I have to sacrifice a single weekend every six months or so, I don't think I can really complain too much. They always set me up in a relatively nice hotel and gave me all these vouchers for food too, so it wasn't really too bad. Only this time, when I got the email about having to take the course, I wasn't too pleased to find out I'd have to drive into the city during a big storm. Of course, it was a three-hour drive, and the drive sucked enough already. It had to be done all the same. I took my time getting to my hotel. It may have taken me double the time to get there. I drove way slower than I probably needed to as well but I wanted to arrive in one piece. I was happy when I finally pulled up to my destination. I was completely exhausted. The rain was coming down like crazy. Honestly, it almost felt like it was following me. I was actually pretty upset when I got outside of the car and found myself standing in front of a gross and sleazy motel. There were some seedy characters standing out front, and there was not one single bit of me that wanted to spend the night there. Seeing as it was already 10pm though and I didn't have the means to stay anywhere else, I didn't really have much of a choice. I walked into the small room that would usually be called a lobby, but calling this a lobby would be an insult to lobbies everywhere. It was just a room with a guy sitting in a recliner with a laptop and a TV tray. I told him I was checking in and gave him my name. He asked if I was traveling alone, and I instinctually said yes, my first mistake. He asked for payment, and I quickly explained to him that my company was paying for it. I noticed a brief moment where he looked a little bit confused, but he wiped that look off his face within seconds and apologized. He said he'd forgotten and typed something into the computer then told me I was good to go. I was given the key to my room and a small paper map to show how to get there. I opened the door to my room and was immediately met with this stench of cigarettes. My mom smoked when I was a kid, so the smell didn't bring back any happy memories, I'll just say. I closed and locked the door behind me. Everything in me was telling me to just turn around, get back in my car, and go home. But I like my job and I didn't want to risk losing it. I inspected the gross comforter and ended up taking it off the bed altogether. I sat down on the sheets and decided to call my boss and ask why they put me in such a disgusting place. I knew it was late, but she and I had become pretty good friends at this point, which made me feel like calling at that hour was not completely unprofessional. The phone rang over and over, but she never answered. I left her a message and hung up the phone. I sat there in silence for a while. I didn't want to lay down in that bed or even take my shoes off. I was pretty sure I'd even noticed a blood stain on the pillowcase. I knew there was a 99% chance that if I looked to see if there were any bed bugs, I'd probably find them. After around 30 minutes of contemplating what I should do, I decided to sleep in my car instead. That would probably be better than spending any more time in that disgusting room. I grabbed my bag and exited the room as quietly as possible. I was grossed out beyond belief, but I still wanted to be courteous to the people in the rooms around me and not wake them up when I closed the door behind me. As I got outside, I was relieved to see the shady men that were standing a few doors down when I'd pulled up were no longer there. I know you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but being cautious is not exactly a crime either. I loaded my bag into my car and hopped in the back seat to try and get some sleep before the refresher course the next day. I don't know how long I was asleep before I was woken up by the sound of men talking not too far from where I was. I peeked out from behind the driver's seat to notice the man who'd checked me in earlier 
standing outside the room I'd abandoned not long before. He was talking to the two shady men I'd seen when I'd pulled up earlier. I watched and was horrified as he pulled out a key and began unlocking the door to my room. I could have tried to make excuses for what they were doing, but in that moment my heart was going so fast, it was obvious. They turned the knob slowly and crept in without turning the light on. I realized that the second they figured out I wasn't in there, my car would be the first place they'd look. I'd be in some real danger then. I tried my hardest to be as quiet as possible as I climbed back into the front seat of my car. I turned the key in the ignition and heard shouting. I saw the lights going on in the room and the three men came running out, shouting something at me in a language I didn't understand. In that moment, the car refused to start. It was completely dead. I tried it over and over, but nothing was happening. A man approached my window and told me to get out. I obviously was not planning on doing that. I took out my phone and dialed 911. Thankfully, the operator answered soon. I frantically told her what was going on, and she told me the earliest an officer could get to me was about 20 minutes. Apparently, service was delayed because of the storm. She told me she'd stay on the line with me, and I appreciated her for doing that. I just want to say that when I look back on the situation, I honestly believe she's the reason I made it through this whole ordeal alive, and I'm not more traumatized than I already was. These men were relentless. They tried everything to get access to the car. They tried breaking the windows and even got a crowbar to try and pry the door open. After 10 minutes of failing to get into the vehicle, one of the men got frustrated and jumped on the hood and started smashing the windshield with his foot. I guess in that moment my fight or flight kicked in and my reaction was not flight. The operator reassured me I could do whatever I needed to do since my life was in immediate danger. I even remember her telling me I might have to kill these men. In that moment, I was fully prepared to end a life. I opened the door and stepped out. I don't think they had been expecting that. They leapt at me immediately. Thankfully, all three of these men were weighing about 100 pounds soaking wet. They were incredibly skinny. I like to assume they had the mentality that because they were men, they could just overpower me easily. But they were dead wrong. The first man who rushed at me, I easily threw him off balance and slammed his head against the ground. It did enough damage to ensure that he wouldn't be getting up anytime soon. The second guy tried to like tackle me to the ground, but he was so skinny that he couldn't move me. I grabbed him by the hair and pulled him off me best I could. His other friend had a knife. I felt it make a shallow cut into my back. The pain wasn't too bad, but the shock of it made me let go of the man I'd previously gotten a hold of. Before I knew it, I was on the ground being kicked. I was trying to protect my head, mostly out of instinct. At that moment, from my periphery, I saw the red and blue flashing lights in the distance. A feeling of relief washed over me, even as I was being beaten. I reached out my arm and grabbed one of the men by the ankle. I pulled on his leg as hard as I could, and he fell to the ground. The other man ran when he saw the police. Out of pure adrenaline and anger, I got up and started pounding the head of this now defenseless man over and over. I was hitting him so much that I was soaking wet from the rain. Blood was starting to pour down his head and onto the asphalt. I didn't even hear the officer yelling for me to stop in that moment. I just felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned and got a good look at the face of the man I was beating. He was unconscious, and his face looked like ground meat. They eventually took him away in an ambulance. I was also taken to the hospital as well. The beating I took caused some serious bruises, and I had the cut on my back, but thankfully there were no major injuries. I got around 10 stitches on the wound on my back. It was not pleasant, but I was just happy to be alive. My manager ended up calling me back not long after I got out of the hospital. She was completely frantic and had no idea what I was talking about in my voicemail. She said she had booked me a really nice hotel in the same city and had no idea why I ended up where I did. She sent me the info of the correct hotel and I realized immediately what had happened here. 
Both places had the exact same name but a different spelling. I ended up at the wrong place. The guy in the lobby had a confused look on his face because he actually didn't have any idea what I was talking about. He just pretended so he could check me into a room that he would have access to a single traveling female alone. The perfect target. I drove home in a rental car later that day after being discharged from the hospital. I decided to take some time off from work as well. My car was towed back into town and repaired at the expense of the company I worked for. I guess there was some serious damage done to the engine, presumably to stop me from trying to get away. And the company I worked for was actually very supportive after everything that happened. I was also pleased to find out they caught the other attacker who had run away that night. Apparently, he was hiding out at his mother's house. I was asked to come ID him, which was not the easiest thing I've ever had to do, but I did it to make sure those men couldn't hurt me or anyone else ever again. I guess it wasn't the first time something similar had happened in that motel, only they could never really prove it before my incident. Most of these guys were just some strung out drug addicts, hence why they were so small. The trial had to be delayed due to the lockdowns, but they were all charged with attempted kidnapping and aggravated assault. They're actually awaiting trial in jail. I'm hoping for justice and for all three of those men to spend a good amount of time behind bars. I know I'm just one of the lucky ones. I don't know what I would have done or what would have happened if I was a smaller woman or if no one had come to help me. Would I even be here today? Would I even be able to tell this story? I don't know, but I am, and I'm grateful that I survived. This happened to me about a month ago in rural Michigan. I was out in a rural area on a big 5,000 acre patch of state land, doing some rabbit hunting by myself. I had been walking for two or three hours and hadn't seen a damn thing. I decided to turn back and start making my way back to where I'd parked my car. When I got back to the main trail, I basically had to walk about a mile east, then take a left and had another two-ish miles north to get to my car. As I was walking east, though, I started to get this really, really unsettling feeling. Everything was just a bit quieter than usual, quiet even for a day with a decent amount of snow on the ground. The eastbound trail before the turn is a lot of small fields off to the side and hills up until a final flat stretch. As I got up one of the last hills, I looked to my left at a big field for a second in case I saw any last minute rabbits or coyotes. By the time I turned my head back to the path ahead, there was a guy right in front of me, about a hundred yards away. He seemed to be walking away from me. Something about him didn't sit right with me, though. For one, he'd appeared out of nowhere. He also had no hiking, hunting, or camping gear, just a long sleeve shirt and some dirty jeans with this big beanie hat on. He was walking really strangely, not really picking his feet up, just sort of dragging them along and kicking up snow, kind of like how a kid would if he was bored, but this was a grown-ass man. On top of all of this, this was later in the day at almost sundown. There were no other cars in the area I'd parked when I got there, which was the only reasonable way onto this trail. There was no way this guy had driven there suddenly to take a quick hike right behind me. I kept walking a little slower, and all of a sudden the guy just stopped in place. He turned his head halfway, and I could tell he was looking at me. All of a sudden, he snapped his head back and just bolted off running. This startled the shit out of me, and I stopped walking. Now I knew there was something seriously wrong with this guy. I stopped and swapped the birdshot in my shotgun to a few buckshot shells I always carried in my backpack just in case. I kept walking forward cautiously, and once I got to the turn in the trail, I looked down at the trail and the guy was nowhere to be seen. The final stretch was about two miles, and it was completely flat. 
There was no way he could have made it all the way down the trail by the time I got there, even if he was Usain Bolt. I could see the footprints of heavy boots in the snow. It was a nice trail, but the sides were covered with thick brush and deep forest. I knew this guy was hiding somewhere off to the side in the brush somewhere. That had to be the longest, most unsettling walk in my entire life. I tried to stay with his boot trail in the snow to try and get an idea of where he was, but it was lost in old prints from whatever group had hunted the trail earlier that morning. I racked a shell in the shotgun as loud as I could in hopes he'd hear it and be deterred, but that didn't really comfort me much. When I was walking near extra heavy thickets, I could have sworn I'd heard something inside them. Even once I got back to my car, I was still in the middle of nowhere surrounded by more forest. I kept the gun loaded with me as I got inside, so I didn't have to unload it at my trunk and be exposed before I got in the vehicle and locked it. Something just felt very, very wrong with that guy, and I'm never going hunting in that area alone ever again. I remember I'd just gotten off a shift at the restaurant I used to serve at. I was having a drink at the bar and waiting to pick up some food to bring home. At that point, a random guy came up to me and started talking to me and hitting on me. I was not super interested and politely declined. I then proceeded to bike back to my apartment as usual. A couple of weeks later, I was at the same restaurant with some friends this time. That was when I saw the same guy. He told me that the first time he'd met me, he and his friend had followed me back home when I was biking. I tried to leave the bar as quickly as I could, needless to say, and I biked home as fast as possible. My coworker contacted me, saying that the man had left the bar right after I did, and drove away in the same direction I headed. The next time I saw the co-worker who'd messaged me, he said he was thankful to see me arrive at work alive and well. I'm glad I decided to take a different path after he sent me that message. When I was in university, I moved into an apartment by myself. I needed my internet and TV hooked up. The guy came over to hook everything up and was a little bit chatty but generally seemed nice. Now, I hate having strangers in my place, so I was not exactly very chatty back and I did not let the guy stick around. The next day, I was just getting out of the shower when my apartment buzzer started ringing over and over. When I answered it, there was a man I'd never seen before outside. Hi, I'm here from Shaw. You just had TV and internet installed yesterday, and I'm here to make sure it's all working correctly. I was only wearing a towel, and I was weirded out because it was working just fine. Nobody had told me there would be a follow-up appointment either. I lied through my teeth and said, Sorry, I have a bunch of people over right now. It's not a good time. I slammed the door in his face. I immediately called up the Shaw service and asked if they'd sent someone over. They said they did not. It really freaked me out, and I debated whether to call the police or not. But when I looked back outside, the man had already left. I was in Portland, Oregon about six months ago for training at work. A bunch of co-workers and I went out drinking the last night we were there. They ended up going home before me, and I found myself trying to find my own way home around 3.30 a.m. with a dead phone. There's a large homeless population in Portland, many of which I passed by sleeping on the sidewalk under various shop entrances. At one point, I came across a bus stop and what appeared to be a little old woman bent over, looking for something in her purse. I asked her which direction my hotel was in. She immediately whirled around and I noticed her teeth were rotting 
They looked as if they were sharpened at the ends, most likely from the decay. She had leathery tan skin, frizzy white hair, and these terrifying light blue eyes that were opened as wide as they would go. She let out a scream at the top of her lungs, not like a scared scream, but like a witch scream. Don't go down that road back there. There's a man with a knife hiding, and he's not a good person. Don't go down there. He's a bad guy. She just stood there wide-eyed, then turned to a road and kept pointing, repeating that over and over and yelling. I listened for about five seconds before I took off in the other direction, about ready to shit my pants. I looked back down about a block away, and she was still there pointing and yelling, the most terrifying encounter I ever experienced. 